Welcome to ASRS's Journal of Vitriol Diseases Authors Forum. I'm your host, Dr. Timothy Murray, Editor-in-Chief of JVRD. On each episode of the JVRD Authors Forum, I will interview innovative retinal researchers on their studies featured only in JVRD and how these studies will impact our patients' care in our clinics. Tune in to hear directly from investigators about the clinical implications of the newest and highest quality research in the field of retina. Welcome to JVRD's Author Forum. It's my pleasure to be joined today by Dr. John Thompson, past president of the ASRS and the associate editor-in-chief of JVRD. John practices with retina specialists and is joining us today to talk about his paper focused on outcomes of pars plana vitrectomy with membrane peel for lamellar macular holes and related conditions using a new optical coherence tomography consensus definition. Welcome, John. Thank you. Good to see you, Tim. Always a pleasure. So your, can you take me through a little bit about what prompted your interest in the topic and how you began to structure this report? Well, a group of uh, retina specialists who are interested in lamellar macular holes and pseudo holes came together several years ago to try to develop a consensus classification because in the literature, there was a lot of uh, variability when people would report series of pseudo holes or lamellar macular holes. We weren't all talking about the same thing. So this group of about a dozen um, people who are interested in this came together. We looked at lots and lots of different OCTs uh, primarily and some color photos to uh, try to come up with a consensus classification that would allow us to study particular subgroups of this sort of broad, poorly defined general category. And this consensus ca classification was uh, developed and published in British Journal of Ophthalmology in 2020. So that was the baseline. Uh, and I've been doing uh, vitrectomy for patients with macular pseudo holes and what I called lamellar macular holes for a while. And I realized that we didn't talk about the same thing. So I thought, well, this would be a chance to go back and look retrospectively at um, various um, pictures, OCTs, and to see how these patients did. And we came up with, uh, and this is the group, consensus group, with three different categories. The first one was lamellar macular hole, and these are patients that essentially had an irregular foveal contour, uh, and they had thin fovea. So if you looked at the very center of the fovea, the fovea was thin, and uh, there was some loss of foveal tissue compared to the normal anatomy. And those were the pure lamellar macular holes. And then there were the macular pseudo holes, and the macular pseudo holes was what was largely defined back in the pre-OCT era where you look in at the fovea and you see what looks like a macular hole and there's a surrounding epiretinal membrane. And, and at first glance, you would say, oh, there's a macular hole there. But we learned once OCT was developed that these were not holes. Uh, in fact, uh, the foveal tissue was often thickened. So these are patients that had actual thickening of the perifoveal retina and they would have a steep contour as a result of the thickening of the perifoveal retina. Uh, but the central fovea was not uh, thinned uh, at all. And then the third group uh, were patients that we called epiretinal membrane fovea schesis. And these were eyes that had epiretinal membranes. And the epiretinal membranes caused schesis in the Henle fiber layer. So they had this schesis-like appearance uh, and we really felt that those were different than the macular pseudoholes. And so these were the three categories that we had developed in this consensus group. And so uh, Tariq Muhammad, a resident who was working with me and myself, went through my cases of patients with vitrectomy for this and uh, subcategorized them into the three categories and said, well, how do these patients do with vitrectomy? Do they all do well? Does one group not do well? 
I will like to emphasize, though, that these are patients that had decreased vision. There are lots of patients that walk in with lamellar macular holes who have 20, 20, 20, 25 vision and no symptoms. So these were not patients that we operated on. So all of the patients that we operated on had decreased vision with symptoms consistent with an epiretinal membrane or macular hole, lamellar macular hole, I should say. And uh, these were the eyes that I did surgery on. So we looked retrospectively and said, which eyes benefited from the surgery and which eyes didn't benefit? So before you get there, John, one of the things that um, I think that you're fairly focused and relatively conservative in your surgical management. So do you think there was a chance of an inclusion bias for those patients that underwent surgery? Was there a group that had maybe a decrease in vision, but you elected not to operate? Is that something that occurred or did every patient that presented like this with a decrease in vision go to the OR? Certainly every patient did not go to the OR and it was primarily driven by number one, the visual acuity and number two, patient complaints. If a patient came in with 2040 vision and a macular pseudo hole and they had no complaints, then I didn't operate on them. Right. So from that standpoint, there was a selection bias because I was operating on patients who had symptomatic decreased acuity. And I think that's important because for me, at least, that was the group that I'm most concerned to have an ongoing visual loss potentially, so that when you look at outcomes with final visual acuities, you have to put it in the context of these were the at-risk eyes. Yes, I would agree. These were eyes that were at risk. Uh, there have been some studies looking at lamellar macular holes before this consensus classification. And as we all know, um, many lamellar macular holes remain quite stable. Uh, they have impressive looking OCTs, but you see them year after year and their vision's good and nothing really happens. So I was operating on the eyes that uh, had symptomatic decreased vision. So you also incorporated ILM management in terms of these cases. That, that's been a little bit controversial for some people with the potential of converting to a full thickness hole. Do you have any insight for us as to how you approach these eyes surgically? I really felt that it was important to remove the ILM and the ILM was removed with staining um, and the reason I removed the ILM is that virtually all of these eyes have an epiretinal membrane. And I felt that if I didn't remove the membrane, then I wasn't potentially going to relieve the traction that led to the lamellar macular hole or the pseudo hole or the schesis. And so I did remove ILM, but your point about developing a full thickness macular hole is certainly a valid concern. And in the patients with lamellar macular holes, I routinely put an air bubble in the eye because I was concerned about that possibility. And patients would typically remain face down for a couple of days. And the idea was that if in the process of peeling the ILM, I ended up with uh, a micro hole, I never ended up with a visible macular hole after I peeled ILM, but if I ended up with a micro hole, I wanted to make sure that had a chance to close off. Yeah, I think that's a that's an important clinical pearl, and then and then for any surgical procedure, of course, we're concerned about the complications. So, what what did your series look like for retinal detachment, full thickness macular hole, recurrent membrane? Well, we did not have any retinal detachments in this series. I mean, it was a smaller series. We did not have any full thickness macular holes developed, and I attributed it correctly or incorrectly with the fact that I used the uh, air bubble. Right. And then I think you focused for this paper very critically on the subdivision by the OCT classification, looking at uh, visual acuity outcomes for these patients. Could you talk us through those results? Yes. The patients that had the macular pseudo holes behave very much like patients with regular epiretinal membranes. They had a significant improvement in visual acuity uh, with the surgery, both at one year and the final exam, which was an average of three to four years afterwards. These were patients that had been followed a while. And uh, on the other hand, the patients with the lamellar macular holes as a group showed a statistically significant improvement at one year, but that significance was lost by the final exam. And when we looked at a subgroup analysis, we found that the patients that had a lot of disruption in the ellipsoid layer didn't tend to improve, while the patients that had pretty normal-looking ellipsoid zone 
tended to improve. And so we think that that's a useful criteria to use when you have a patient like this with a lamellar macular hole, uh, you need to look carefully at the OCT to try to decide, can you potentially help this patient or not in that situation? And the patients with the epiretinal membrane foveoschisis behave very much like the macular pseudohole. These eyes improved uh, significantly with their visual acuity. You know, the average vision preoperatively was around 2060, and most of the patients were 2040 in range in the final examination. So it wasn't a 2020 eye, but it was a significant improvement. And most of the patients could appreciate the improvement in visual acuity. And so put this in a context for us clinically, is it changed your management either to go to the OR earlier or to have a subset of eyes that you're no longer considering operating on? Well, the only group that I don't consider operating on now, again, this is symptomatic decreased acuity, are the ones where the OCT really looks pretty bad. I mean, there's a lot of disruption in the ellipsoid zone. Perhaps the fovea is really thin, you know, 50 microns or less, you know, almost a full thickness hole. And those eyes I'm less enthusiastic about, but it's actually made me more comfortable doing the surgery in patients where the ellipsoid zone does look good. Um, and certainly the patients with the macular pseudoholes do very well, uh, essentially the same as patients with idiopathic epiretinal membranes and the same with the epiretinal membrane foveoschisis. So I feel more comfortable doing those eyes because really complications were quite rare in those groups. Uh, and the main complication, of course, is just nuclear sclerosis in patients uh, who are phacic at the time of surgery. But we really did not encounter significant other complications uh, in these patients. So as a, as a sort of concluding comment, where are you in patients that are phacic and have some degree of cataract and need a surgical management? Are you recommending combined surgery? Are you having the cataract done first? Do you do the vitrectomy and then refer out? How, how do you approach that? Well, a lot of it depends upon just where uh, the cataract surgeon is. Uh, we have some cataract surgeons that op uh, operated our HOPD, and then I would do combined surgery if they had a visually significant cataract. You know, 2025, 20, 2030 20, cataract, I would do it as combined. But some of these patients come in with essentially clear lenses, and I do feel uh, that it's not appropriate to remove clear lenses. Uh, you know, they'll end up with a cataract nine months, you know, 18 months later and have to have cataract surgery. But I don't think that that's a problem doing them sequentially. Uh, situation is different in Europe, of course, where the retina surgeons tend to do the combined cataract surgery. But in America, we have this separation of power, essentially, between the cataract surgeons and the retina surgeons. Dr. Thompson, thanks for joining us. I think you really um, have put into perspective the importance of OCT classification preoperatively. And, and I think you've given us some strong clinical pearls about how to manage these patients. So thank you very much for joining us today. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Thanks for tuning in to the JVRD Authors Forum. You can watch and listen to more episodes on the ASRS YouTube channel and on popular podcast directories, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Visit www.asrs.org forward slash JVRD forum on the ASRS website to learn more. See you soon.